Hello everyone, hi. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Ravia and I'd like to thank you for joining us. I'm the Customer Support Manager here at Charity Digital and I'm really excited to be hosting today's webinar. It's my first time hosting one, so I'm learning the ropes as we go and please be nice. Um, I'm hoping to run it as smoothly as my colleagues have done in the past. Welcome back to our regular attendees and welcome to anyone joining us for the first time. I hope you all enjoy today's session. I just wanted to mention that I'm hosting from home and I'm not expecting any deliveries, but would still like to apologize in advance for any unexpected interruptions. You just never know with these things. I'd also like to say that I've had steady and reliable internet so far, touch wood, but if we disappear at any point, please bear with us and we'll be back as soon as possible. I promise you the show will go on. <laughs> Um, the unpredictability of working from home certainly applies to today's webinar, which covers how to engage service users whilst working remotely. We are joined by Michal Philip Kofalik, the Senior Manager of Twilio.org, the social impact and nonprofit arm of Twilio, and Christopher Hoffman, the Global Project Manager of Smart Rapid Response Mechanism at the Norwegian Refugee Council. Earlier this year, when the coronavirus emerged and everything changed, most of the workforce transitioned to working from home, which led to digital transformation that might otherwise have taken months or more. Due, and this sort of expansive operation was compressed into days and weeks to respond to remote working and the new reality that we were in. It had a considerable impact on charities as more people needed services and greater support, whilst charities themselves were also adapting to this new reality, often with limited resources. Legacy IT and tech systems added to the challenge and called for an agile approach. Although we at Charity Digital have been remote working for years that you may have heard of, you know, the one day at home, we've been doing that forever almost, moving to a fully remote environment was definitely a new step for us as well along with the rest of the sector and that's why I'm eager to hand over to the experts and hear from them on how they manage this journey. All right, uh, thank you Rabia, that's a pleasure to be uh, with you uh, and with uh, Charity Judel for the second time. Uh, yeah, times are challenging and uh, uh, let's let's jump into the intros. So I'm Michal Kovalik, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a head of a Twilio.org in EMEA, uh, the social impact and a non-profit um, arm of a Twilio communi cloud communication company. Uh, I'm super passionate about uh, what uh, dot orgs could do, so the technology uh, partnerships could do for for non for profits, and I'm super passionate that my company has a goal to help one billion people uh, with cloud communications uh, over the next years. Uh, I'm based out of South London, and the one important thing I want to share is. Uh, I am a victim of the broadband uh, issues this morning, so I might sound choppy today. Together with me, I've got Chris Hoffman. Chris, why don't you, why don't you introduce yourself? Absolutely, thanks, Mikhail, and, and thank you everybody for joining. It's great to meet you. I'm I'm Chris, uh, and as noted, I'm the global project manager for the Smart Rapid Response Mechanism uh, program within NRC. Um, have spent uh, 20 years in the field uh, with a number of UN agencies. Uh, as well as, as NGOs, large-scale NGOs, um, working in the field of direct uh, disaster response and innovation within that space, uh, predominantly centered around digital, uh, digital engagements. Uh, on top of that, I spend a lot of my time working on uh, corporate engagement and, and helping corporates to work with, uh, within the humanitarian sector, either with their current products or developing new things. And... Um, and I'm based in Groningen, Netherlands. So in the north of the Netherlands, very wet here, just like you guys, pretty much the same weather. And I'm a father of four. So I so, uh, deal as many emergencies at home as I do abroad. <laughs> Excellent. Let's, let's jump here. Sure. Well, I mean, Michael, if I can jump in on this one, because I think it's, it's really important. Yeah, uh, of course. About our, our relationship and our partnership. Um, Engaging in, in incorporating uh, partnerships with an NGO is always um, a difficult thing. And I think there's been a lot of history and past in this that, that really centered around CSR engagements 
And what we're finding today uh, in, in this new way of working is that uh, we need to strive towards not only just common interests and common goals, but we need to strive on, on a common partnership ideals. So it's not just about a donor uh, relationship. It's not just about a service provider relationship. It's really about co-development and, and, and bringing things together as a group. And what we found with working with Twilio.org and Twilio itself was that we were able to, through utilizing this kind of approach of how do we do this together, um, that we've been super successful in that we are almost now into 25 countries um, and some of the most difficult countries in the world, including Libya, um, soon to be Syria, in Myanmar, Iraq, uh, and many other places. Uh, and, and so that wouldn't have been able to be done if we were just using Twilio as a service provider or if they were giving us money to do something. We needed to have this really succinct partnership. We were also able to conduct the world's first automated global telephone survey uh, from a humanitarian perspective on the COVID-19 response, which was uh, pretty amazing. We, we engaged with 14,000 different individuals all the way from Northeast Mali um, to, to, to the jungles of, of Colombia and being able to phone them and, and have them tell us how COVID is affecting them and, and their lives and their vulnerabilities. So it's super important. And I just think uh, that what we've seen now through this relationship and what we're gonna see in the future through these corporate partnership relationships with NGOs is that uh, it's all about that partnership, that relationship. It's not about the, the old way of doing things. And I, and I hope we're able to help fuel a bit of that conversation today and hear from you, but also be able to share with you our experience. Thank you, Chris. And if I can add, it's uh, what we've seen, and I'm not trying to sound cliche or anything, but we've we've seen that the majority of the non-for-profits which we've been working with, and we're not we're working with uh, the major multinational uh, non-for-profits like NRC, like Red Cross, like uh, United Nations, but also we're working here in UK with the customers uh, like Age UK, for example, and several others which I'm not able to mention today. Um, and they also seen the uh, the pandemic uh, as an accelerator that no one has expected. Uh, many of the operations, uh, and it includes fundraising, uh, conversations with uh, volunteers, conversations with uh, beneficiaries, it all moved into into digital space. And the, what was what we've seen the difference, and it's something we're going to elaborate in a second. Uh, that the big difference between success and the failure or maybe going fast and going slow is the digital strategy to um, to sit for a second brief and figure out what are the steps that needs to be taken in order to do it properly versus grabbing random tools and and pretending that you're you, you want to move things into the into the internet so very happy to go more structured and yeah uh, looking forward to have some questions later on yeah so Chris, I'm moving us further. So Chris, uh, well, let's let's do it in a way that uh, since you have a since you have a more experience than I uh, in 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 the general non for profit space, uh, why don't you uh, why don't you give us a little bit of the outlook of how do you see the uh, non for profits building their digital strategy? Probably the NRC part will be a, a, a significant one, but also the before you joined uh, NRC and before the COVID happened, where the, all the acceleration uh, came into uh, into the game. What uh, what have you seen in the past, and what are you seeing right now with NRC and others? Absolutely. So it's a really important question. And I think that the way that we saw it in the past was digital strategies were based on three things. The first thing is the digital strategy of what's happening now. Oh, what's the coolest app out there that we can implement? Oh, what's the coolest thing that we can do um, to, to reach out to people? So, so really being very reactive um, and, and, and not strategic. I think the, the second part of the past way of dealing with kind of digital strategies was having it be IT driven and that your IT department was the one that was in charge of designing your digital strategies. And I think the third thing in the past that, that we, we see and that we, we've been a part of is uh, a, a constant environment of pilot, 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 test, 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 pilot, pilot, and never really coming into something with an overarching understanding of the customers that we were trying to serve so that we didn't have to pilot as much as we could have developed more. 
And so what I see in NRC, but what I've seen even more so within the sector in and of itself is being able to number one, take more time to understand our customers. A lot of the nonprofit space understands their customers extremely well. But when they design these strategies, especially these more up-to-date or technologically, uh, let's say heavy uh, strategies, that they don't think about their customer as much as they think about the tech. They're always tech first, customer second. And I think one of the big things in the, the trends that we're seeing is that organizations are, are flipping that piece around and going, who are we really trying to deal with? How much do they actually use mobile phones, for example? How much do they access the computer? Are they really internet savvy enough to be able to utilize the tools that we're producing in a positive way? Are they gonna respond the same way? Do they have the trust in the way that we're engaging with them? Just like we would do with any other type of program. And so I think it's really important that we, we flip this around, we take the customer centered approach uh, towards developing digital strategies. And I think organizations are doing that now. That's that's interesting, and it's it's uh, it's very similar to what we're what we're seeing elsewhere, where uh, companies, where where, where uh, charities, uh, trusts, and general uh, non for profit uh, uh, organizations are looking into. Uh, interacting with the beneficiary, uh, interacting with the volunteers or donors in a way that commercial companies are uh, interacting with you. And I'll give an example of, uh, of Uber, for example. When you order Uber, you are surrounded with their communication. You're, gonna, you're using their app. Seconds later, you're going to get a text message. Uh, then later, you get an email with the confirmation that something happened. So there's a journey. The, 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 the customer in the Uber example is surrounded by the communication and the, he's driven from point A to B, literally. Uh, same with Airbnb, for example. You you know where you, you, you don't just book the the place and and you go on, but you're 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 in this cycle of communication with the Airbnb, then later with the owner of the place, and there is a follow up, and there's a, there's a, a write up about how you how you liked it, and there's another one if you liked the the, the way you you gave the feedback. So the, the their customer is 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 in this small bubble uh, surrounded by the service. And we're seeing this, I'm seeing this in the, in the non-for-profit space and in the, the NRC as well, where you're basically wrapping someone who needs help or someone who can help or someone who can donate in that, um, that cocoon that this person knows where he stands, where she stands with, uh, with the service. So that, that what, what you said is, I think is very powerful. And one of the things that we did, we've been discussing and we've seen it across Norwegian Refugee Council across all the, your sub-organizations because uh, you have like what 30, uh, 30 field organizations Chris? 34 yeah. 34 yeah. There is this there, there are some of your of your colleagues and I'll skip which one they are uh, which are they're, they're, they're so mature in the programming IT skills that we don't have they, they take they do everything by themselves they know how to do things they know how to plan digital strategy they know how to do communications and there are some offices where there is no knowledge for for one or for, for good or bad reason so we discuss this uh, digital maturity model yeah. across uh, the your organizations which can be compared to digital maturi mat uh, maturity across uh, charities in UK how would you how do you define digital maturity and what are what do you think are the the, the, the steps and uh, how to move from step one to step n you know it's 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 it, it, it's important to look at ourselves and and I don't mean that as an organization I mean as individuals and firstly I think we all need to look at and understand our digital maturity and 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 be able to say, what do I need as a person? You know, a lot of the charities in the UK are actually dealing with other UK citizens, right? And so there's there's kind of this idea that, that oh, we're, we're going to help this group of people and they don't know what they're doing or this group of people and they don't know what they're doing. Again, it's this idea that we need to first understand ourselves and our maturity around the digital space and then our customers and their maturity around the digital space. And then we start to dive deeper and look at our organization. So our organization, it's funny, we actually just did, uh, I, I won't give out the results, but we just did a digital maturity assessment yesterday, uh, kind oh. of a flash assessment on where are we at the head office level. 
And what really came out is that we're, we're kind of infants uh, in general, if I can use the, the, the best term possible, in that we are uh, really new to digitizing our journey as staff members. You know, we all have computers. We all know how to use Microsoft Excel. But once you step away from Excel and, and Chrome and, and Outlook, um, it gets very hazy out there. And, and you're, you're very disparages. And so as you go through your, your strategic journey and, and your, your digital maturity, you need to be able to know what is maturity. Is it 13 years old? Is it 16 years old? Is it 20 years old? Or are you just a kid at heart for your whole life? You know, what are you going to be and how are you going to define that maturity as your organization? In some, it might just be the level of digital maturity that you need is a really solid website that allows you to communicate with others. And others you will find that you want to design that customer journey like you talk about with Airbnb. You want to be able to design that cocoon that you can provide for folks and be able to be interactive for them because your customers are growing every day. You're expanding outside, for example, outside of the UK. You need to cut across a number of different countries and a number of different scenarios and a number of different emergencies. You know, so, so you have to really be able to, to understand yourself. So I would say digital maturity is based on know thyself uh, first and then know thy customer second and then be able to, to define what maturity is for you and go beyond that. Right, and if, if I may add to this, we're working with the, uh, one organization which I cannot disclose, we don't have a, uh, we didn't have a rights yet to, uh, to, to, to have a customer story, but we're working one of the uh, UK based organizations, which is highly federated. They have uh, offices or chapters, if you will, across UK. And it's amazing to see that their Manchester chapter, for example, has a very high maturity of uh, digital maturity when they got into thinking how I'm going to help my beneficiaries, they they were able to write the journey uh, and they were able to apply the tools partially Twilio, partially others because you, you need several other components and they were able to do it by themselves. They, they just were asking very technical questions. But on the other hand, we've seen that the same organization but the chapter little south I mean, much more south uh, than Manchester. Uh, they were asking questions where we knew that they they don't even probably know well how their beneficiary move for their health panel. We 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 were looking at like, so you might want to check how uh, what do your beneficiaries exactly want and where before you start designing the, uh, the IT system beyond the Google Sheets, for example. So you're you're absolutely right and. Once you have this, you know, so there's the one part, the, the digital maturity and understanding of the uh, of, of the organization itself. But then the, there comes a technology. What's your experience, Chris, on how corporate partners, technology providers, uh, the integration partners, so the companies that put that stuff together for you, uh, how how do you how you should work with them, and uh, what are the best practices around it? Well, I mean. Our engagement together um, with with our other partners uh, with you has, has been, I think, one of the, the greatest examples of, of oh, how. Thank you. Work. And 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 I don't do that just because we're on the webinar together. I do that from my heart, uh, to be honest and frank. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's very important to me because it's about, I think, firstly, transparency. Um, again, if you go into this this relationship with a partner, no matter what you're doing, and you do it like a service provider, donor kind of, or, or payee, payor kind of perspective, you're never gonna get where you need to go. You need to be transparent about the difficulties in your organization, and I would need to be transparent about the difficulties in mine. What are our red lines? Where do we stop? Where can we not help? Where do we need somebody else to come in? Where are our abilities ending? Where is our maturity ending? Where are we in our maturity journey? towards understanding digital. Being able to be open and transparent about all these things, not coming in and saying, we can do it all. We just need you to give us the tool and I got it under control, right? We need to get away from that. We need to get away from those, 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 those ideas that we know everything because we're, we're in the business of helping others and, or, or we're, we can do everything because we're the one paying you or you can do everything for me because I'm the one paying you. 
we need to get away from that and really open up this transparency picture um, and then have you tell us where our gaps are so that we can start to fill those and, and really be able to have you guide us on these journeys. Mm -hmm. um, this, this journey of programming, for example, mm -hmm. as you say, that's a huge issue yeah. for us. We don't have people with, uh, in, 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 in these very complex cases with Twilio, we need to have somebody that can write JavaScript and, and be able to do these different types of things. And we don't really have a pool of people like that. But to understand transparently that that's a gap, be able to explain that on my side to my teams so that we're able to hire that, but also be able to seek your guidance on maybe finding another partner that could help us do that as well. Right. And uh, what's your take on, uh, what's your take on having, it's, it's, it's not a part of the digital strategy. It's more about being open and being adventurous. Because when you work, when, when the organization, which is just learning about the uh, digital transformation, about the digital strategy and learning what is out there on the market, you're not going to get things right in the first go. I mean, you might, no. you know, good, <laughs> good for you. Uh, but uh, you, and, you and I know that we, we, have, we have several projects uh, together right now going on. I, I've, I think that's now it's up to, up to 10 and we're talking about the major, major projects in, uh, across the entire world. And some of them are are super performing, and uh, you know it's it's, it's great. And uh, we're even given we're even giving similar organizations in the region a view into the, those projects, so they can copy paste because there's no competition. It's more like how do we help each other? But in some other places, not that we're struggling because it's the wrong word when you assume experimentation. But we're we're not moving as fast, and we had to go back. We had to shut down for a second some of our projects and rethink because the first generation of the project was right. What what advice would you give to all the people on the call today uh, about the balance of uh, of of between risk taking and and experimentation and or doing things as they were in the past you, you get my drift right what, what, what's your take on it what, what's the I mean, it's, it's, you've got to have the, an innovation mindset right this idea that as we're going into these new technologies these new approaches these new styles of engagement uh these new trust building exercises with the people that we're trying to serve we need to be able to understand that as we're innovating you know, the, it's the big eyes, right? There's, there's innovate and iterate, and you've got to be able to iterate. And with iteration, that it, there's two things that, that cause iteration, either success or failure. And both of them have to create you, create for you the opportunity to iterate. And, and so, so you have to be as risk averse as you are uh, risk accepting uh, as you walk through this innovation journey. And, and if you don't have that, and if your teams don't have that, and especially if your senior leadership does not understand that, you will fail, to be frank. And, and the reality is, is that that digital maturity that we're talking about fits directly into what we're discussing now. It's not just about your digital maturity in terms of the tech you have, it's the mindset that your organizations need to have to allow you to allow that team member or that staff member or that, that whole team to be able to innovate and iterate with failure and success of equal measure to get towards a very successful end game, which is scale, where, where we wanna be able to roll this out for a number of places. And so it is a mindset uh, fully. I agree, especially in a, such an adventurous, I would say, uh, line of line of uh, support NRC has, uh, where in every country you have something different. You have to be very open about, okay, we're you know we have a product, we have a problem to solve, and you, there there are so many approaches, and let's let's try the one which seems to the most the easiest, but it might not be the one we're going to end up with. In a, in a more standard. Uh, in, in the more standard um, uh, solutions, we, we we see like for example contact center for uh, for fundraising or for or a volunteer um, engagement system for text messages or WhatsApp. There are some templates, right? So I just want to uh, I, I want to make sure that everyone on the call understands that you don't have to experiment and build things from the ground uh, uh, all the time. If if there are some there are some let's say usual ways of running the processes in the charities and non-for-profits that are already known and there are 
uh, there are customer stories, there are products available, I mean, the products, there's the set of blueprints available that you can build and the risk is minimal. But the moment you start thinking, okay, how about us doing this in a little different way? How about us having this little thing that will make lives of others better? That's where you have to be open. Yeah, because you're, you're getting, you're moving away from the standard process or standard practices on the market because you want to do something else. And that's where this mindset you, you Chris mentioned of this like uh, adventurer, this, this explorer, you have, to, you have to be ready for failure, right? And that, that's, that, that's, that's, that's where we're going to end up at, at some yeah. point. I mean, you got to think about ourselves. Again, I keep bringing this back, but, but it's the reality. You have to think about you, who you are. Think about where you were 15 years ago in terms of your mobile phone in your pocket. <laughs> think about where you were 20 years ago with your MP3 player in your pocket. You know, and think about where we are today. We've all been adventurers. We're all adventurers. We just sometimes need to realize that and we need to get back to that in our understanding that, that as human beings, right now, the revolution that we're all going through mentally, physically, everything that's changing in our lives as human beings is centered on our, our, our ability to be adventurous. And, and so we just need to always be re, rethinking about that, thanking ourselves for all the greatness that we are as humans, but also thinking about what the potential is of human beings. There's a, there's a great book out there called um, The Next Billion by uh, Dr. Uh, Aurora, uh, Payal Aurora. And she's talking about what, is digi what is, uh, the digital future look like for the next billion people that are born you know, in the next few years? And how, how are we going to help usher them into these new technologies and things like that? And when you dig deep into it, you realize that it's really about us as human beings and understanding who we are and, and what our capacities are and being able to build on that. Yeah. And, I, and since we spoke about failures and successes, or to be on a positive note, about successes and the failures, uh, from your experience, Chris, uh, what are your or good examples of the of the partnership of charities slash non for profits and the technology partners, and what are the examples that you you might give as a don't go that way? Don't go that way. Let me start with that. I'm always good at being a cynic and a big negative. Answer. So let me start with the don't go. Uh, the you're American. You're, you're not ironic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, look. You know, I think. Um, Project-based digital adventures are not a place that I like to be. So if it's a project, if you've gotten some money to do something cool in your office, um, that is not strategic. That is a project that will probably start and end. And what you're going to get out of that is an app that is going to be on Google Play and then you're not going to have money to, to get it back on Google Play the next year or whatever else. And it's just going to fail and sit and, 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 and languish in, in the digital cloud. Um, that, that there are a number of examples for that. Another great one from the nonprofit world is energy transition. Uh, there's a lot of solar panels throughout East and Central Africa that were established many, many years ago that the batteries were never replaced or the maintenance, the operations and maintenance contracts were never re-signed after the first year. It's this idea of project-based uh, technological advancement is the wrong process. It has to be something that is strategic, that is developed, and that has a journey, that it, it goes from A to B to C to D. So some of the positive things, you know, some of the positive relationships that I've seen in the past are really around this. Again, number one, establishing a partnership. It's not about money. It's about your relationship together, okay? Where you're both trying to go, what are your common values, your common goals as both nonprofit and for-profit partner. And how are you gonna go on this journey together? I'll give an example. Um, I, I won't say which organization, but let me, uh, Michael uh, might know this story. You might've heard this one before. We have a corporate partner um, that we are working on with technology that's not able, that was not able to access certain markets. They were not able to go into certain countries uh, because they just never saw the, the need for it. And by engaging with, uh, with a not-for-profit that was working in those countries, they were actually able to bring that corporate partner into those markets. So not only are you seeing uh, corporate partners engaging with not-for-profits and, and helping them to provide a solution to the people that are in need, vulnerable people, et cetera, but what you're seeing now are not-for-profits 
recognizing the, the need for the digital advancement of bringing in these, these partnerships and, and ushering them into new markets for them for you know, increased profitability over time and expansion of their business. So it, it is, it's symbiotic. We have to re realize this symbiosis between the two organizations is not about money and money receiver, money payer. It's about symbiosis of growth, of, of expansion, and, and, and of, of um, what we say, you know, joint benefit, co-benefit to, to, to these issues. And it's probably, it's important to choose the right partner in the beginning, right? If you see that there's the mindset in the, during the first conversation about what we could achieve together is right versus the right away jumping into the money conversation, having a lawyer in a, waiting on the other side of the door with, with a contract, you, you might want to consider, okay, what's the long-term, what's the long-term journey together, especially when we fail, right? We don't want to end up in a, in a legal dispute. We want to end up in, the, in, the, with, in front of a whiteboard and say, like, okay, it didn't work. Let's do it again. And let's do it again. So uh, let's assume that we did it well uh, uh, after a few tries and or some, we, we deployed something standard. Uh, and it works well because it works in the several organizations elsewhere, like like contact center, like uh, like volunteer engagement, like uh, video calls instead of face to face uh, meetings. How once it's deployed, how do you how do you see the support system uh, going on? Because it's you're not buying, you know, it, everything you buy, everything that moves is it the car. It doesn't have, it doesn't even have to move. It's, it can be a house. It can be a plane or you buy a software. It needs maintenance. It needs support. People need to learn. People forget. People things break down. How do you? How do you organize it in NRC or in a, how do you see it in other companies that there's this internal support system to keep new projects, to keep that digital transformation alive versus like, okay, it doesn't work. We're going back to where we were. Well, you know, there's, there's a couple of different levels to that, that conversation, right? The first level is a distinct tool or a distinct engagement, right? So how do you, you provide support? For example, Microsoft Office, okay? And then you've got your stack all the things that are sitting back there behind you all of your different softwares how do you provide work for that and then you've got your hardware and the support around the hardware i think it goes without saying again not to reiterate the same point again and again but it goes through the maturity question on what is your level of maturity and once you're able to establish your level of maturity digitally you can then start to establish what best support function fits for you I tend to err on the side of letting the experts provide support to me. I am not an expert in Twilio. I am not an expert in Microsoft Office. I am not an expert on you know, a number of other pieces of software. There's no way I'm gonna be able to provide very distinct support to my field offices on this. I can do some troubleshooting here and there, but that heavy duty support, I can't do. Now, is it worth me as NRC to now have 10 folks sitting in, in an office or sitting at their home providing this service, or is it better for me to outsource that? And I'm always gonna err on outsourcing because I think it's the right thing to do. You get to the experts, it's more cost effective, it's more efficient, it's less management, it's contractual. There's so many great things about being able to outsource that type of support um, that, that I think they're, they're in the future, I, the future for me in IT departments throughout organizations such as NRC and others, I think Chris Hoffman's opinion is that ITs are gonna shrink. Their offices are gonna keep on shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And you're going to see this outsource support increasing, increasing, kind of raising of tickets when you've got a problem and then it's answered within 12 hours. And then if you need to pick up a hotline, you've got a hotline that you can dial in when you need that support. And then also the training. So developing, for example, what we're doing together, Mikhail, is developing a, a training module for our team, specifically to us at NRC, on Twilio, but designed by Twilio with us. So Twilio knows all their stuff, right? So they know what needs to be taught. We know the gaps in our staff's knowledge and the way that we teach. So we bring these two things together. It works out perfect. Twilio knows what needs to be done. We know what needs to be done and they provide the support or somebody that is an expert within Twilio or around yeah. uh, the software itself can provide that support. Exactly, and uh, in a one of a uh, one of uh, um, or even two uh, our projects, we also have external support, like a third party, the solution integrator, uh, system integrator, uh, um, that is helping, based out of UK, uh, south of London. Uh, they 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 know they're they're 
pretty good in the Microsoft stack. They're pretty good with the uh, uh, with Twilio stack. They know what they're doing. They did a lot of projects before, and they could also help. And we have a couple of them, not a couple, we've got a few of them in the, in the UK, Ireland uh, uh, geography, that could also help as the uh, eye opener, uh, writing the digital strategy, and and building and then maintaining those projects. So this is yet another way. If if for example, size of a, of your charity is is a few people and it's hard to get attraction with the larger corporate, why not help? Why not why not check in uh, a trusted partner of that technology partner that might be interested in your segment? And we've seen that we we've seen several small and large project being, uh, being uh, deployed by, by these kind of partners. So I, I think there are two ways of, of having that support system in a, uh, uh, up and running. We're, 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 we're like in 35 minutes of our conversation, hopefully not many people are asleep and I'm seeing 30 questions uh, lined up. So Rabia, I think we'll need your help uh, to, uh, if that's okay, uh, to, to um, help us with a uh, facilitation and moderation of those questions. Hi, Michal and Christopher. Yes, absolutely. Oh, it's been such a lively discussion. And I've really enjoyed hearing you both talk about your subject and reading the chat and the conversations that are happening. Um, okay, so I'm going to use the question and answer feature on Zoom. So for anyone doing this for the first time, it sort of pops up next to the participants um, button. You can add the questions you like, you can upvote the ones that you really want to hear responses from. And I'm just gonna dive in now. So our first question comes from George. Hi, George. Um, some of the most useful information we have is feedback from people who are not engaging with us digitally, but those not engaged are the least responsive. How would you approach the issue of finding out from people who aren't engaging, why they aren't engaging and what they want and how the charity can address this? Chris, why don't you take a step? Send them an SMS. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we, we have to see, this is a part and parcel of our problem, right? Not only do we not have people that aren't engaging, we have a, a lot of the population that doesn't even have phones, for example, when we're talking about utilizing uh, mobile technology. So, I mean, I think that it is, it's gotta be a learning experience. I think being able to survey it, what we found, like for example, with Twilio, and I wanna use this example because it, it's, it's very appropriate for this, is being able to send out recorded phone messages. You know, so if we know that people aren't responding via text, if we know that people aren't responding via WhatsApp, Remember that the phone has a number of different things that it can do. And one of those things is a phone call. And you can do it, um, you can do it with a person on the phone or you can do it with a recorded message and have them kind of answer the recorded message back. So there, there, there are a few different ways that you can peel an orange, let us say. And this is, um, this is another way of being able to do it is find a different channel exactly. to engage with them. Yeah, yeah we, we, we've, we've uh, just to add it and uh, in, and it's it's both geographically, age and education related. Different groups of people have a different. Boy, that's very generic what I'm saying, but you're probably gonna understand what I'm, what I'm trying to convene is. There's always a per, there needs there needs to be a perfect combination of channels to be found. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some groups that don't use uh, text messages. For them, it's an obsolete technology. I I I. I believe if you're working, if your charity works with teenagers in UK, if you send them a text message or email, they will look at you like, why? But if you start uh, going to addressing them through Facebook uh, and WhatsApp as a combination, that will be a completely different conversation, right? They will be start the same thing that when people are in the field, they might not be able to uh, reply to a text message right away. You might want to give them a, 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 a heads up through text message or, or call them or, or so they're, they're probably the, this piece of research, Chris, you mentioned is that what's the best way? What are you using every day? How do you communicate with, with, with your bank? How do you communicate with your mother? And based on that, you will understand what's the, uh, okay, so these are the channels. These are the timings in the day. And this is a frequency and, 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 and experiment. And, and fail. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the things that we did um, is we sent a warning message. So we sent a text message first, telling them that they were going to get a call. So the way and the reason for that is many people will see a robot call or a call that comes to them that's automated, 
and, and be like, ah, no, hanging up. But if you inform them first that they're gonna receive a call and it's gonna ask them some questions about something that's important to them, they might actually stay on the phone, right? Another issue that we addressed uh, that we've really struggled with was how many questions are too many? And, and what we found was we could actually study using, using software such as Twilio and others that over a period of time, you know, question one, everybody answers. Question two, 90% answer. Question three, you know, 40% answer. Question four, 20% answer. By question five, everybody's hung up and they don't even answer. And, and, and as an example, so these are things that you have to you have to study, right? You have to take the time, you gotta try. And what's great about this technology is that the expense of it, which is very small, is uh, offers you the opportunity to test this. Right? It's not like you're, you're outlaying a whole bunch of money in the beginning. And if you test, you, you're afraid to, to try something else because it was so expensive. This technology and these types of digital mobile technologies that we're using, such as Twilio, gives you an opportunity to actually test it at a cost that's acceptable enough for failure. And I think that that's really important. Great. Thank you both. Okay, so the, our next question is from Steve. Um, many of the NFPs we support in the local area are very small. Digital exclusion is a big problem. There are barriers to access being the IT equipment, the skills and confidence to use, and the ongoing costs of support and data. Any tips or advice on how we can begin to address these challenges as everything goes digital, as the ones in most need of support are further left behind? So possibly related, but worth, very worth asking. Yeah, so let, let me take... Yeah, yeah, and uh, the, the the one one thing that we that we've seen is the first of all a bit of advertisement. Hope you don't mind. Uh, when you work with Twilio on Twilio products, every charity uh, is given the product credit of a five, of a worth of five hundred dollars, which means for a small charity, it's a usage for probably a year of 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 the text messages, of voice, of 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 emails or contact center. It's it's for for small. 10, 15 people size of a charity, it's almost, um, um, it, it's a lot. Um, the, the way you, you could approach this is to compare what costs are generated by your physical activities right now uh, versus the IT. Uh, I mean, IT, uh, that's one thing that, that you mentioned there, and the cost of the, of the communication of this digital strategy, because you don't have to buy a server. You don't have to employ the IT person. What you need to do is a little bit of a subscription. Uh, with the external partner, very happy to share the list later of people, of, of like the partners we're working with, and have a conversation. What would it take to get this project going? It might not be as expensive as you think. And the second, and a, and a second item is uh, going back to the, the, the alternative cost. Um, we were we were speaking to one of the large non for profits, and they said they whenever they they think about project digital projects, not only with Twilio but in general, they compare: Do I fuel up my Jeep and drive 50 miles to talk to someone, or do I make a phone call? And this is the this is the type of the um, shifting the budgets and thinking: What's cheaper? What's more effective? And uh, what's safer in some countries as well? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think that there's something to be said just to add on that because I agree with you 100%. I think the other piece that needs to be brought into that is the idea that you can consolidate um, amongst yourself. So if you're in one locality, like you're in one village or, or one city, and many of you have kind of joint ends to what you're trying to, to serve and do, there's a great opportunity for you to actually work together and create an opportunity to, to actually cost save and cost share. Um, you might actually have the same beneficiaries, right? The same people you all might be serving. And so the opportunity for you to engage with them with a single phone number could be a great opportunity, uh, you know, um, or, or a consortium. Uh, you know, there's a lot of consortiums. I don't think it happens as much in national level NGOs, especially in the global north, as much as it happens in the global south, where we're creating large consortiums of 10 and 15, 20 different um, non-governmental agencies. Uh, serving tens of millions of people at once, um, we have to have a consortium because we can't do it on our own. And so sometimes I think that the national level NGOs stop, have to stop always looking at competition um, and looking at more consolidation as they move forward as well. That's, so that's a brilliant, that's that's a brilliant one. Ethos that you need to adopt yeah. as a group of people as well that you might want to consider. That's brilliant. 
Excellent, thank you. And it very much is in line with the ethos of the type of work that we all do across the sector. We have a related, possibly related question from Georgina about um, for small charities, what would be your main advice in terms of prioritizing digital with a very limited or in some cases no budget? I think I think Chris just just answered this one and actually it made me think uh, you you probably know similar charities that work in the same way and just put the budget together because uh, first of all service is not that expensive and uh, and Chris you just said you're working and I'm not going to throw names but I know two examples where NRC is working with the similar if not larger organization or basically you're using the same, they, they you, you've offered them to use the tool you develop for cost sharing. Yeah? Right. And it's not only the service, it's also the man hours and, and the support. So probably this informal consortia, it's, it's, a, it's a very good idea. No, it's very important. The other thing, I mean, Mimi, on your, your question, it really depends. And I know that I, I don't wanna, that's not a cop-out answer. It really depends on who you're trying to serve and what as a, as a nonprofit you're trying to do. What is your goal? And then you need to go back and say, well, our goal is to help X with Y. You say, okay, now can that be done digitally? Yes or no. And if it can be, is that our future? Do we see ourselves as a not-for-profit being successful and scalable and growing with the population we're serving by using digital means? If that answer is yes, then you need to pivot yourself away from the old way of doing things and bring yourself into the new way of working. And, and, and that is difficult, painful, can be painstaking, but I'll tell you what, in the end, you're gonna reach more people, have greater impact and be more efficient in your costs. And you need to be able to have that difficult discussion much like you do with your child about going to a university or, or whatever else. Those are difficult discussions that you're always gonna have in your life. And you have to have it organizationally and get, get past some of these old biases that we have about engaging with somebody versus a phone. It's not that personal, those types of things. The reality is, is that everybody has one. We all use it and we all use it daily, hourly. For me, about every other minute. And, and the reality is, is that we have to realize that this is a tool that no matter how old we are is part of our lives today and is gonna be part of our lives for the foreseeable future until we don't even need phones and we'll have something else like an ear implant or something. But for now, phones are here to stay and we need to use it. <laughs> Let's not go there. Let's yeah. go there. That's great, thank you. And um, for me, that was definitely very clarifying and I hope that'd be clarifying for the people asking the questions as well. And we're gonna move in a slightly different direction from how digital may encroach upon our physical bodies into a question from Nusrat, who asks, is there an example of an NFP organization that has achieved high levels of digital maturity or are there any checklists to check against to help us with our assessment of our own digital maturity? Great question. And yes, um, there are the big companies out there, the Accentures of the world, the Deloitte's of the world will do an, can do an assessment of your organization. Um, there is, I just saw yesterday an assessment that was put out by uh, MIT. I think it was in the Sloan School that any organization can do. Um, I would be happy to share some of these examples with Rabia. She can put them on the website so you guys can, can start to see what kind of digital assessment you can do on your digital maturity. But there is a lot. You just, I'm, I'm dead serious. Just uh, Google search digital maturity assessment and you're going to find some online already. There are some out there. And I think the Accentures and the Deloitte ones are, again, at a much higher level, much more corporate centric in, in many ways. Um, but you'll be able to also be able to look at the, at the smaller level kind of SME or, or small nonprofit uh, examples as well. I'm, I'm very glad, Clarice, that you haven't asked our uh, participants of a webinar today to talk to Accenture because that would be a very costly, uh, yeah, very, was... very costly exercise. So go, 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 go on the website. That, that's what we're, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There. Yeah. Great, thank you. Especially in light of the budget issues that we discussed earlier, 
I would very much second and third that. Okay, so our next question comes from Heather, who asks, it's good to see other questions about small local charities. While we need to develop our strategy, what we need is some suggestions about what has worked to include those who are excluded. What tools exist that we could look into? We're a homelessness prevention charity and need help working out how we reach people who might not be reached and can digital work for us. I think she's meaning how we can reach um, people within the homeless community who may not have access to the tools that the rest of us may have. That's a, that's, that reminds me, again, I don't know the profile of, of Heather's uh, uh, organization, so apologies, so I'm cutting corners here. But we, we have a, not exactly the same, but similar uh, uh, example uh, with the Red Cross in uh, in US, where lack of, uh, lack of uh, devices uh, basically nearly killed the project. And it was about uh, volunteer engagement in the tornado uh, 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 impacted areas. There's no communication. The, the landlines are gone. The, uh, the, the BTS, the, the, the wireless uh, technology wiped out. So what they did, they managed to build a very crude, the system, which is based on a very crude technology, again, a text message, which is able to catch, uh, uh, catch information if you move a little around, and that, uh, that the lack of, the, of ownership of, uh, of technology by the beneficiaries, in this case, the, the victims of the, of the tornado, was like relayed through the volunteers who had access to, uh, to, the, uh, to the technology. So again, uh, not knowing the full profile, there are ways and means to to to, uh, um, to remedy that, if it's the right way to put it. Heather, I think it's a great question as well, because we deal with this a lot, right? And this is a very big question for us. In many countries that we serve, many people don't have phones. In many refugee camps, we only have between 20 and 30% saturation of mobile phones. Uh, uh, that means, so of adults, maybe only 20 or 30% have it. And so much like our learning of our poor children these days, we have to do some sort of blended approach and look and see, um, well, a few things. Firstly, you look and see if a blended approach works. How much face-to-face -face versus any digital communication could you do and how would that help? What you might find, Heather, through, through, through this assessment that you're doing is that actually digital communication with the homeless doesn't work. It's not an effective tool and doing what you're doing does work. But what you might also find is that digital communication with your donors is the best way for you to increase your digital maturity and your ability to utilize new tools to the benefit of the homeless. So it might not be about the way that you deliver. It might be the way that you are uh, provided the opportunity to deliver. So you always need to be thinking about this in a number of different ways. It doesn't always have to be about implementation. It can also be about fundraising. It can also be about awareness raising. Okay, so awareness raising doesn't mean you're raising funds. It could be that you're just telling people that we've got a homeless problem in a, and you're sending out a number of SMSs to people that have subscribed to your newsletter, right? Or WhatsApp messages, whatever. But then what you'll find is, is that by engaging with them and informing them, they find it to be a very important issue for you and then they want to donate. So you have to think about how this circle works how you're able to utilize these tools to your benefit. It might not be, and it really doesn't sound like, to be honest, in your situation, it might be the right tool to engage with the beneficiaries you're trying to serve, the vulnerable people that need help. But it can be a way for you to raise more funds so you can help them more, right? So it's, 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 a, it's a play that you have to walk through and understand, yeah? Brilliant, okay, thank you very much. Oh, um, oh, the questions are coming in. Oh, I, I apologize now. There will be some that I might not be able to get to, but I'll come to the next one. It comes from Chris, who asks about his charity that works on Zoom calls to provide one-to-one -one support to young people during the COVID situation. If young people are allowed to travel into the city center or to public buildings, they can use the free Wi-Fi. If they don't want to speak in public or they're under any sort of movement restrictions, they need data to communicate. Do you know of any ways that data packages can be reverse charged? Not that I'm aware of because it's like a 0800 for data. It, uh, technically, it might be a little hard, but the way telecoms are doing this, uh, they are whitelisting uh, some of the services uh, that go uh, that you connect. For example, uh, my, my my free 
uh, phone uh, operator gave me Go Binge, which means if I connect to Netflix, Spotify, Deezer, and something else, I'm using data, but I'm not built for that data. I'm not charged, so it's being it's being somehow taken. It's I. It must be. Uh, it's it must be some some deal between the three and and Netflix because the. the they're, they're paying for the data anyway. So uh, the way to do it, and I'm not sure if it's possible with Zoom, but it's we're working on this uh, on uh, with Twilio, but it's a, in a crisis response. We're in the 911 for in the, in Central Eastern Europe, where the the, address, the the app the it's not an app. It's like a web-based uh, uh, technology. Has the URL has an address which is recognized by the uh, by the Vodafone in Austria and Czech Republic, and they know that if this URL is being used, we're not charging the beneficiary, so the someone on on the on the on the, on the side on the client side for for data usage. So it is possible. It's not exactly back charge, but I think there are there are ways and means. It's, it's just conversation uh, with the with the Vodafones of this world if they're interested in uh, doing such a uh, uh, such arrangement. It's probably something I, I'm, I'm going to dive into because it's very inter very very interesting conversation. Thank yeah, you. And, and my examples are very, very different because we, we do do a lot of back charging, uh, but it's because the predominance of the global south works on a prepaid phone system where you buy credit, you know, uh, in a local shop and you add two pounds to your phone of data. And, and so what we're able to do through our system is actually be able to know how long we've spent using their data accessing our service and we're able to send them that, that money back. Oh, so the voucher. Yeah, a, a voucher, right? Yeah, that's brilliant for yeah. prepaid. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and that's just one way of doing it, but it's it's it's. I don't think it's applicable in the UK situation. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, thank you both very much. Very insightful. Um, okay, so our next question comes, and this person would like to ask if you have any top tips for someone just starting on their digital service delivery journey. Chris, this is this one is for you. And I'll make it quick because I know we're at the top of the hour. So any top tips for someone? Um, let me, let me, let me one more time. Think about what's important to you as a person when you're engaging with a phone and what you like and what you don't like about it. Think about your customer, the people that you're serving. Think about what access they have, what knowledge they have, what level of digital maturity they themselves have. Then go and ask them. How best is it to communicate with you? Do that assessment, grab on to them, walk through the journey with them, because if you do it with a few, you know that it's probably gonna be replicable for many others, okay? Those are my top tips. There's a lot of other things, you know, but the last, I guess the last overarching piece to end with is that again, never go into these corporate partnerships and these digital partnerships and digital strategies with a service provider, payor, payee kind of mentality. Go in there with a sense that we're going to work together to design and co-design solutions to the betterment of the people we're trying to help. That's why we're there as NGOs. That's why we're there as .orgs. That's why we're there as, as non-for-profits is to help others that are in need. So let's do it in the best way that we can. So that's it. Brilliant. Thank you both very much. And thank you all to all of our attendees. Thank you all for joining us on this lovely webinar. I just have a quick comment to make which is firstly, I hope you enjoyed our webinar. I found the conversation very interesting and I hope you will return for more of our sort of content. I do have a request. If you could please fill in our feedback form, it's really, really vital. It helps us shape and deliver the kind of content that charities really need and the kind of content that charities really want, especially in the current climate. It's going to pop up on your screen once you leave the webinar and it really shouldn't take too much of your time. I'd like to thank you in advance for all feedback. It all helps us. And we're just enormously grateful to you for your feedback. And we're enormously grateful to our speakers who've joined us today for this webinar. Pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have awesome. a wonderful day. Stay safe. Thank Stay you. Well. Bye.